Good afternoon, everybody. It's so nice to see all of you and welcome more people on Zoom as well um, for a very, very exciting CDCR seminar. Um, I think possibly the, the highest energy one um, by my wonderful friend and colleague, uh, Dr. Daniel Schrammick. So I want you all to welcome Daniel who joined the Lunenfeld Tannenbaum Research Institute in April, 2015. And Daniel has trained in Europe, um, as well as Australia and the US, receiving a BA and a master's in molecular biology, a PhD in genetics, and an executive and a master's in technology management. Uh, he trained as a postdoctoral fellow and Emerald Foundation Young Investigator at the Rockefeller University in New York. Daniel's research focuses on leveraging functional genomics to make major advances in treating human cancers in a personalized and a very specific manner. And he has identified and characterized multiple novel mechanisms and given insights into how and why tumors develop. Um, his goal is to discover the driving mutations in breast and bladder cancer. And of course, he's using his incredible platform of in vivo CRISPR-Cas9 technology that he has actually built and created from the ground up in order to find all of the genes that are required for uh, tumor growth. And he has some really stunning papers. I know most of you have already looked up his past papers, but he's published in two of my favorite journals. One is Science. Science is everybody's favorite journal and Cancer Discovery. His science paper is about uh, the discovery of a new non-coding uh, polymorphism driving ID DH1 mutant glioma and his very talented PhD student Connor Yankis um, uh, did this beautiful work with uh, Daniel's guidance. And um, for our breast cancer aficionados, he's really showed a beautiful, um, a beautiful publication in Cancer Discovery talking about how there's a loss of epigenetic regulation disrupting lineage integrity, which actually induces aberrant alveogenesis and promotes breast cancer. So please make sure you read these groundbreaking papers. The thing about Daniel is that he's honestly one of the most creative scientists that I have ever met. Um, he is able to apply um, ingenuity and outside of the box thinking, not only to technology development, which is one thing, but to actually um, knowing how to use his tools to solve cognate biological problems. And I've often seen in the track of Daniel's research how um, he's found something serendipitous and he has an instinct where he knows how to capture that finding and follow it when other people might not have even seen that thing. So it's a combination of ingenuity and creativity and insight. And um, I'm really excited to see what Daniel does over the course of the rest of his long career. Um, today, he's going to be talking to us about using CRISPR to unravel novel cancer driver alterations in mice. So please help me welcome Daniel Schrammick. Thank you so much. I am extremely excited and a little bit intimidated um, to be here because we had Sheila giving a seminar before the summer and how could you ever follow that? But I will do my best, okay? Um, so I started my lab in 2015 in uh, Toronto. Never planned to end up there, but I love it. So it's great. Um, what we are doing is trying to understand molecular medicine and human genetics. The tools we use is functional genomics and proteomics. Now that's not so new. Everybody's trying to do that. But what we try to do is to put a new spin on this whole uh, system by using functional genomics and proteomics directly in genetic mouse models. And the reason for this is I think we have learned a lot and there's still a lot to learn of in vitro culture systems. But I think that we are now at the point where we can use the mouse models and other models to actually get more and deeper insight into disease etiology, but also into ways of treating the disease. Because a cell line in a dish is not the same as a tumor in an organism. Now, what I want to do today is to tell you a little bit about our CRISPR technology and how we're using that to decipher novel genetic alterations that cause cancer, as well as finding new vulnerabilities of cancer. Today, I thought I'm going to focus on those alterations which are outside of what we usually think about in cancer, outside of the gene, the protein coding genome, okay? And specifically in what we have been thinking about as the dark genome um, which is definitely not dark. It's actually really quite important. So the first story is um, about elucidating how germline variants interact with the somatic mutations to drive low-grade glioma. The bigger picture of that story is why do some people get cancer and why do some people don't get cancer? The background of those is we have now started to sequence healthy tissue and healthy tissue is rattled with mutations which look exactly the same as the tumors within that tissue. However, there is no tumor. So something needs to keep these things in check 
or there need to be some factors which allow the tumor to actually give rise um, and, and, and then grow. The second story is then to think about a little bit deeper about these mutations in the non-coding regulatory elements and to assess them in a more systematic level. The first story um, is by Connor Yankers, as Sheila just mentioned, his paper just came out and he graduated and is now um, very quickly started in a very nice position at um, Artisan Biotherapeutics, I guess. Um, and the other story is from an MD PhD student in the lab, Robin. Now, Cleoma. I don't need to tell you too much about Cleoma because you have got Sheila here, so you know probably much more than I do. I had to learn a lot about it because I'm coming from a breast cancer, had a neck cancer, and maybe pancreas cancer background. The reason why I started with studying low-grade Cleoma was a sad one. My twin brother, the very day I started my job at the Lunenfeld, got diagnosed with a low-grade Cleoma. And at that situation, when you are miles, miles, miles away in a different country, and he is in Austria, um, the only thing you can do is start to read up, start to understand the disease, and try to help a little bit that way. Um, while doing so, it occurred that these low-grade cleomas are really totally understudied, and there was not even a model to study those things. And that's where we came in. So in general, 27% of brain tumors are cleomas. These are 80% of the malignant tumors. These are the bad ones. The 23,000 new cases every year. So it's not the most common cancer disease, but it's really um, a very critical one. The reason being is that it's highly, highly lethal. We usually describe low-grade cleomas and high-grade cleomas. The high-grade cleomas are the GBMs. These are the ones probably you know most about. These are the ones with a survival um, of one to one and a half years, right? Low-grade cleomas are a little bit different. They occur in patients between 30 and 40 years. After that, the incidence actually decreases sharply. So that's an interesting feature. They are not as aggressive. They're low-grade. The problem really is that they grow to a tremendous size, okay? They grow to a tremendous size so that most patients actually um, fulfill most of their cognitive function with the other hemisphere. And the reason for that is that these tumors grow so slowly that we can assume that these tumors grow over 20 to 30 years. And that actually means that most likely this is a pediatric disease. And we have got now indications that it is a pediatric disease, but just grows so slowly that it's being diagnosed between 30 and 40. And that's also the reason why later on it actually decreases in, in, in incidence. Now, if you look at the survival, it looks still horrible. Reason for that is that most, if not all of these patients actually progress to a secondary GBM-like disease and then it's as incurable as a normal GBM. Now, in 2015, the very year um, my brother was diagnosed and I started my position, there were three very, very influential papers. They all described the genomics of low-grade cleomas. And there are three subtypes. I'm showing two because the third subtype looks like GBM, has the same survival of GBM, and one could argue that it's just a misdiagnosed GBM. The first two subtypes, what they have in common is that all, they all carry a mutation in IDH1 or IDH2. It's always basically at the same codon. It's always a gain of function mutation. So this is a very homogeneous disease if you think about it because it's driven by one oncogene, IDH. They differ in that type one low-grade cleomas have a 1P19Q code deletion. They usually show third promoter mutations and they're enriched in CSE and FEPP1 mutations. Type two, has basically all of them P53 mutations and two thirds show actually ATRX mutation. Now the type two are again, much more aggressive than type ones. And that's what we're gonna focus on on this talk. As in every other disease, then there's a long tail of mutations which are recurrent, but only between two to five to 10% of cases. And that's what's shown down here. But it is actually quite impressive that the trunk limitations of this disease is more homogeneous than I've seen in any other cancer. Now, what is this IDH mutation doing? IDH is a protein, which is an enzyme in the citric acid cycle. It turns isocitrate to alpha ketoglutrate. Alpha ketoglutrate is very, very important in the citric acid cycle, but it's also an important cofactor for many, many enzymes. Some of them being DNA, methylase, and uh, enzymes or um, histone um, um, modifying enzymes. So they can do an epigenetic reprogramming of the cellular state. And it's thought that this epigenetic reprogramming is basically what causes cells to be stuck in a more stem-like um, feature. And that's what drives actually the tumorigenic potential. But they're also involved in other, for example, signaling um, cascades, such as the chunk signaling cascade. 
Now, if you have got this IDH gain of function mutation, what actually happens is that this mutant protein takes alpha ketoglutarate and turns it into an oncometabolite called 2 hydroxyglutarate And this 2 hydroxyglutarate is now actually a competitive inhibitor of the cofactor alpha ketoglutarate. Now, previously, many, many people have tried to establish an IDH mutant model, either a cellular model or a mouse model. And all these efforts have failed over the last decade. Not a single cell line of a human patient survives in culture for reasons we basically don't know. There are some which do, but these are set, uh, genetically so unstable that they don't represent the primary disease. And no mouse model has ever been established. And that really has limited the potential of doing any research, because if you don't have any material to do research with, where are you going to do drug testing? Where are you going to ask which gene is important or not? Where are you going to ask about metabolomics? If you don't have anything to work, you cannot do anything. So generating a model is extremely important. There were some attempts. In 2012, the Tuckmark group actually crossed an IDH mutant mouse to nesting in chief of Cree. These mice die at first day of birth due to brain hemorrhage, no tumors. In uh, 2016, there was an inducible IDH mutant mouse. They didn't develop any tumors within two, two uh, years. In 17, uh, Pirozzi et al. crossed in P53 mutant in there. They now get tumors to 15%. But that was a very confusing paper because without the IDH mutation, the penetrance is 30% and much faster. That would indicate that this IDH gain of function mutation is a tumor suppressor, which is really against everything the clinical data actually shows us. And then there were two other papers in 18 and 19. And there they took the IDH mutation they added a P53 mutation and ATRX mutation. These are the truncal events, so very good. They by themselves don't form tumors. So to get tumors, they actually had to add PDGF alpha, CDK2, and P10, or a very strong oncogene, NRAS, G12V. Now, then they form tumors. These form tumors are not low-grade gliomas, they're high-grade gliomas. And by the way, NRAS mutations are never found in these tumors in humans, nor are PDGF alpha amplifications. So while this is a model, it's not a low-grade model, and it doesn't have anything to do from the mutational point of view um, as the primary disease. So we thought we might uh, do this a little bit more differently. So what we did was actually taking a pre-inducible IDH mutation, cross it to a P53 dominant negative mutation and a Cas9 GFP. The idea was then to use CRE to excise the lockstop lox cassette and start expression of the IDH, the gain of function P53 mutation, and the Cas9 GFP. The way we envisioned to do that was actually with a lentivirus, which harbors CRE, plus an sgRNA targeting ATRX. And out of a sudden, we have got the IDH mutation, the P53 mutation, and the ATRX mutation, all as a truncal event. And the way we do this is with a technology we developed a couple of years ago where we've got a very high titer lentivirus and we inject either a P1 mouse into the ventricle or at E10.5. The use of the Cas9 rather than AD TRX flox, floxed animal, which we now also have, was uh, decided because there we can then be much more flexible with which genes we actually can um, mutate. And we use this in a progression screen to ask what actually causes primary to secondary GBMs but I'm not gonna show this data today. But to show you that we can actually target the neural stem cells, which are the founders and likely cell of origin for this disease, you can do the following trick. You can inject CRE into the subventricular zone, into the ventricle and therefore infect the subventricular zone. If you get stem cells, stem cells uh, migrate down the rustal migratory stream into the olfactory bulb. So if you do this in a um, better gal reporter mouse, you see that the olfactory bulb is actually all blue. We did this with Cree with a lox to blox TD tomato, and you can appreciate that the olfactory bulb is red. Therefore, we infected neural stem cells. To test if CRISPR-Cas9 efficacy work, we then did the following experiment. We crossed our lox to blox Cas9 GFP mouse to a lox to blox TD tomato mouse. If Cree comes along, you turn on TD tomato and Cas9 GFP. Red plus green gives yellow. So your olfactory bulb all of a sudden is all yellow. If you then have an sgRNA targeting GFP, you destroy the GFP again, you get red-only revertants, and the amount of red-only cells will give you actually the efficacy of your CRISPR-Cas9 in vivo efficacy. And we tweaked the system till we got 95% of knockout efficiency in vivo. 
With this in hand, um, uh, we went back and wanted to make sure that our technique is good enough to actually generate GBMs. You always have to benchmark your system and do that for two years till you're sure that you're good enough for ever what you want to do. Super important. So what we did was actually taking a Cree virus and checked it into a P10 flux flux, P53 flux flux, RB1 flux flux animal. And you can see that these animals develop tumors extremely efficiently with very short latency. So it works. We did the same thing with a PA3 kinase gain of function mutation in P53. It worked again to 100% penetrance. So our system is good enough. How about the IDH? The validation of the IDH is shown here. So we have got the IDH gain of function Cree inducible mouse model. We either inject at GFP or at CRE. At CRE leads to the expression of the IDH, which can be shown on a Western blot with an IDH specific Western blot. We can also measure by mass cytometry the two hydroxyglutarate that's warping through uh, within the brain. And then IHC actually shows that we get clonal induction of the mutant IDH protein. So everything works, everything we have is good. So, what about the tumor phenotype? So here we have got these complex compound mutant mouse models. We inject either scrambled or ATRX, and then we looked for tumor survival. And that was a very long experiment. I'm talking about 500 days. It's very long for a mouse. It's even longer for a PhD student and devastating. Now, the results you see here were quite intriguing. The P53 wild type animal without the IDH mutation is shown in black, survives over 500 days, beautiful. Then you have got in red, the mice, which are P53 heterozygous with the ATRX or scramble. They start to um, come down at, five, at basically a year. You have got in dark blue, the IDH mutations with the P53 mutation and the ATRX mutation, same survival. And then in light blue, you've got the IDH for the P53 wild type. Now here we're looking at overall survival. The reason most of these animals actually died was because of sarcomas and lymphomas. That was surprising in the beginning, Till we realized that the ID, uh, sorry, that the P53 knocking allele is actually a P53 null when it's not recombined, meaning that the P53 R270 over plus is a P53 heterozygous animal. And those animals are known to develop sarcomas and lymphomas within a year. So, what we had to do is basically take all these animals and look at their brains. And that's shown here. So, first we developed a scoring sheet where you either have a frank tumor. You have got ectopic hyperplastic regions. You have got hyperproliferations in zones where you expect proliferation, such as the subventricular zone, or no phenotype. So when we look at mice, which are wild type for ATR or um, knocked out for ATRX, there's not much happening in the brain. If you have got an IDH mutation with an ATRX mutation, you see about 10% of animals develop low-grade gliomas. If you're just P53 now with ATRX, nothing really happens. If you're now IDH mutant plus P53 mutant plus an ATRX mutations, about 20 to 30% of animals develop tumors in their brain. If you are also actually losing the Walter P53 allele, you get a few brain tumors, which is expected. And then you see again, this 20 to 30% penetrance within low grade gliomas within the brain. If you have got ATRX null, P53 null and IDH mutants. Now, if you look at the histology, you can see that these tumors are actually quite big. They're GFP positive, as you would expect. There's low granularity. There is uh, IDH uh, they are IDH positive, OLIC2 positive, nesting positive, PDGF alpha positive, GVAP positive, low CAS67, no CAS base. So by histology, they actually look like low-grade gliomas. That means that's the first truly low-grade glioma model. And if you then do transcriptomics and compare it to human low-grade gliomas, they actually cluster that shows that we have got the first low-grade glioma model. So that's cute, but what does it mean? If you have got something which takes 500 days and has 30% penetrance, you cannot do anything, right? You cannot do a truck test, you cannot do real genomics. It, it's really, really, really hard. Scientifically, it's actually surprising because if you think about the human phenotype, the three trunk mutations give you low-grade gliomas at a Penetrance, which seems to be really, really high at midlife, actually before midlife. In our mice, we have to wait for end stage and only 30% get it. So either the mouse is not the ideal system or something is missing. I thought that something is missing and this something through reading up the literature was maybe a germline factor, which I thought would be really, really intriguing. So we read up on it. And this RS557 SNP is associated with IDH mutant low-grade glioma, not IDH wild-type glioma, not wild-type GBMs, not any other tumor, only IDH mutant glioma. 
It's on 8Q24. It's within an intron of a CC of a long, long coding RNA, um, otherwise in the gene desert. And it's an A to G single nucleotide polymorphism. If you look at GWAS data, that's the signal you get. It's whopping high. It's this A to G mutation. Sorry, it's a variant. And it's a naturally occurring variant. So if you've got 100 people, it's 0.01% carry this risk allele. So you can blow this up. It's this tiny sliver over here. If you look into your patients, it's 40% of the patients. That's a 600-fold increase. And it's the strongest genetic association of any SNP with cancer, only comparable with BRCA1 mutations, where the BRCA1 mutation is within the coding regions of BRCA1, right? So nobody knew anything about this, this RS557. So the question was, what is it? The first thing I did was basically just mining public data. Never forget about mining public data. There's so much data out there that you can write whole papers about it. They're called data parrots. Forget about all this. Everything you need is usually online. Look online. So if you look online and use the TCG database and ask, is this region open or not, a toxic data, you see the following thing. Here are all the tumors they assessed. Down here, you've got the low-grade cleomas. I pulled up the IDH. All of them are IDH mutants. And everything is red, indicating that this locus is open. There's one other tumor type, which is actually melanoma. It's also open. That's important for later on. There's one tiny sliver down here where this region is also open. It's a GBM. But if you look carefully, there's an IDH mutation, indicating it's a secondary GBM, which is actually a low-grade cleoma. So this is super specific and indicates that this is an open region. Now, then we teamed up um, uh, with the Jenkins group from the Mayo Clinic and did a lot of chip seek sequencing for all the enhancer marks. And the data is shown here. So we did cleosis, IDH wild type GBM-like tumors, and then IDH mutant non-codel or codel tumors. The red line is the RS557, and you can appreciate that in cleosis, so normal brain just inflamed, in IDH wild type GBM-like tumors, it's relatively um, closed and not marked with enhancer regions. But in the IDH mutant ones, it's littered with an enhancer phenotype, okay? Now, interestingly, this is depending on the IDH mutation and independent of the risk allele because the AA, the AGs, and the GGs basically show you the same distribution. So that indicates that the IDH mutation might open up that locus. Now, we then thought that's interesting. Let's fine map the locus. For gene set, for our Chiva studies, you have to remember that most of this or all of the SNPs on there are just tag SNPs. They're just used to mark a haplotype. They're usually not the risk allele, right? The risk variant. So what we did was actually deep sequencing a lot of students, a lot of uh, students, a lot of patients. Um, the controls were students, by the way. <laughs> and there were four haplotypes, A, B, C, and D. You see that C and uh, B basically have two risk alleles, the RS557 and another one, 14.7. By calculating the odds ratio, it turns out that RS557 must be the trunco event, and the RS14 is a secondary event which came to the haplotype because every patient which had the RS557 has the RS5, uh, RS14. And then we deep sequenced the whole locus. And the only variant on there is actually RS557, very strongly indicating that the risk allele in this case is really the tag SNP and responsible for the phenotype. Now, the other thing we did was a lot of RNA sequencing. And here it turned out, if you look at the hallmarks of, of the gene set enrichment, that tumors are enriched in the hallmarks of cancer. That's not surprising. The fun thing is actually shown here on the last column. If we compare the G allele to the A allele, the risk allele to the non-risk allele, you actually see that you get all these pathways upregulated, which you usually see in high-grade GBMs, indicating that the SNP really does have an effect, and the SNP carriers look more like GBM-like patients. Now, the other thing the Jenkins group actually found is that this thing is ultra-conserved. I'm talking about sequence conservation. It's completely sequ uh, sequence conserved down to platypus. If something is really conserved, it's usually super important. Um, and it's not only sequence conserved, also the synteny of the genes left and right is completely maintained. Now that allows you to do no mouse experiments, right? And the first mouse experiment we did was just 
asking a mouse reporter, where is this thing active? So here we took the A, we took the G allele, 3000 base pairs flanking both sides, knocked it into a Luxet reporter, placed the Luxet reporter into a safe harbor and asked, where do we get Luxet staining? So when we do this with the non-risk allele, what turns out to be labeled at E11.5 are melanoblasts. I told you about the melanomas, right? So that was interesting. And then a little bit later, you see that this uh, report actually comes active in the hindbrain. Now, if you now look at the risk allele, it's much, much stronger. You see ectopic activation within the ribs, which you only see later in the non-risk allele. But most impressively, you see that out of a sudden, you see the midbrain and the forebrain to light up. And that's probably where those low-grade gliomas start, right? Now, let's put this into context. You're changing one nucleotide and you're getting a difference in enhancer quality. I thought that was pretty impressive. Now, the other thing we then did was actually modeling the A allele and the G allele in these mice. And we generated a second allele where we just took out 66 base pair from that region. We crossed it to the IDH mouse, to the P53 mouse, to the Cas9 mouse, injected um, SGATRX versus scrambled and looked for survival. Now, what you see here in uh, orange and in red are the mice, which are either mutant for the G allele or a mutant for the whole 66 base pairs. And these mice now come down with tumors at 150 to 200 days. And if you look at the tumor penetrance, it's almost complete tumor penetrance. Let's put this into context. You're changing one nucleotide out of 3.2 billion, and you're changing completely the tumor phenotype. All that is germline. That's pretty impressive. It basically means that an IDH mutation, a P53 mutation, an ATRX mutation, and a normal mouse doesn't do anything. But if you're a G allele carrier, which only happens in 0.01% in the human population, you get tumors to 100% penetrance with low latency, about midlife. That's basically the phenotype we see in our patients, right? Now, what does it do? Um, uh, you have got the RS557 risk allele and the non-risk allele. And if you run this through um, a motif analysis, what actually the motif analysis spit out, it's a hidden OC24 motif, okay? Now that's interesting. If you then look left and right, there's an ASL12 motif and a SOX249 motif. Now SOX2 and ASL12 are super important in brain development, but also in G, uh, GBM development and OC2 obviously too. So we wanted to know if this is actually true. So what we did was chip PCR. So you're pulling on, for example, H3K27 or H3K4 monomethyl, which are um, enhancer marks. And you're asking, do you pull that region? And yes, you do. And then you can do the same thing for OC2 and SOX2. And you ask, do you pull that region? And you do. We were working here in the um, mice, which are heterozygous. So once we put this onto a gel, and ask which allele are we actually pulling down? It turns out that we are preferentially pulling down the wild type allele, but not the deleted allele. But the control, the histone H3, pulls down both alleles. So that actually indicates that H2, SOX2, are at least binding in the regions of the 66 base per deletion. You can do, this, do the same thing with OCT4, and it's exactly the same phenotype. Now, that's all mouse. Who cares? Nobody, because we need to show this in human. Now, that was a really, really difficult experiment because I told you that these cells don't grow. A postdoc of mine spent about three years to find one condition where they grow a little bit more, and it's with a Ross scavenger. We got primary cells from the Taylor lab, uh, Michael Taylor's lab, and we got worth a 12 well. We fostered these mice, these cells, for over one and a half years to get two six wells. And then we did one experiment that's shown here. So we pulled on OC2 and asked, do we get the region? And yes, we get the region. But the kicker experiment is here. Then we sequenced what we pulled down. If you pull down input, because this was RS557 A to G heterozygous carrier, you get the A and you get the G, awesome. You pull on H3, the histone, you get the A and the G as expected, awesome. You pull on OC2, and you preferentially get A and much less the G. Very much indicating that OC2 preferentially binds the non-risk allele over the risk allele, and that OC2 cannot bind the risk allele anymore. 
Now then we did a lot of high C. And here it's actually shown data from uh, Anna Bombo's lab, which is a beautiful in situ high C within mice. So we are comparing um, uh, oligodendrocytes with mouse ES cells and look at the RS557 locus. If you look in ES cells, there is a little bit of interaction of the SNP uh, within the surrounding area. But interestingly, if you do the same thing within oligodendrocytes, we out of a sudden, of, out of a sudden see that RS557 interacts all the way to MIC and MIC interacts all the way to RS557. And MIC is important, right? So the question is, does RS557 do anything with MIC? And this is shown here. So now we took neural stem cells from our mice. We had AA mice, AG mice, and GG mice. And then we also differentiated these neural stem cells down the OPC lineage, the oligodendrocyte lineage. And as you can see, the relative expression of MIC is actually dependent on the amount of G. So the more amount of G you have, the higher the expression is. And if you go from one to about eight fold increase of MIC, that might be really meaningful. And that's actually shown here also in this, in this Western blot. Now, then there was a review a question of that's all good, but how do you know whether MIC drives no good gliomas or not? And I was like, that's a stupid experiment, Jesus Christ. But okay, you do what the reviewer actually wants you to do. So we take our mice and then we started to have an overexpression system and stuck it into a mice. And yeah, here's the picture. If you drive MIC, then you drive cancer. What a finding. Um, so that comes down to the working uh, hypothesis right now. And I think this is really quite interesting. In most somatic cells, the RS557 locus is closed and not marked with any enhancers. If you're in a clear glioma precursor cell line, you actually see that there is an interaction, but RS557 binds OC2, 4, and any other OC2 factors, we don't know that, and starts to repress MIC. In an IDH mutant background, what actually happens is that the reprogramming due to the IDH mutant is actually marking all this with enhancers, activating the regions, opening up the regions. But still, if you are a, a carrier of the non-risk allele, OC2, 4 will still suppress MIC. However, if you are unlucky and you inherited the G allele, OC2 cannot bind anymore. Therefore, OC2 cannot suppress MIC. MIC goes up, and therefore, you're predisposed to cancer. Now, the fun thing is that this is a super specific interaction between a somatic mutation and a germline, a germline variant, a benign variant, which is actually cancer specific. And that's one of the first, first examples shown that there is a somatic to cancer predisposing molecular mechanism, how these things happen. Um, and I think this is quite intriguing. Now we could publish that after a lot of work with a lot of clinicians. And that brings me back to how important it is that people work together across countries and across, because no matter how, we need to get a lot of patients data. We need a lot of patients to collaborate. I call them patients collaborators because without them, we cannot do anything. And this work together is super, super important. Now, what did we learn? RS557 cooperates with IDIDH mutations, and that probably explains the inheritable factor of low-grade gliomas, and that's in 40% of patients. I think that's meaningful. It lies within an LGG-specific enhancer. It actually disrupts OC2-4 binding and SOX2 binding, that there is a long-range interaction with MIC, and it regulates MIC. I think we now have the first faithful model for LGGs. But it shows this interaction of germline variants and non-regulatory elements and regulatory elements within certain cell types. And it poses a very, very, very important question. What else in a non-regulatory, in a non-coding, but regulatory um, genome is actually important in cancer, okay? And that is interesting because we all have focused so far as a team onto the coding regions, right? Everybody's going after protein coding regions. And 99% of the reoccurring mutations in cancer are actually not in that region, but we all look there, right? So why are we not looking into the non-coding region? The reason for this is because we didn't know that all these mutations are there, but this whole genome sequencing studies being done around the world is now actually giving us a window and an opportunity into looking indeed into those, right? So if you think a little bit closer for the coding region, we know that there are 576 consensus cancer genes. You have PF3 kinase mutations, HRS mutations, P53 mutations, RB1 mutations, we all know them, right? But 99% is in the non-coding region. So what do we know about the non-coding regions? 
two things, third promoter mutations and MALAD1. Everything else is maybe described, but not really. So there's opportunity and we should find out how, what is happening there, how important is it, right? So a friend of mine um, at the OSCR, Raymond Yuri, Yuri Raymond, um, actually took the whole genome sequencing done in the PCOP and looked at the frequently mutated regulatory regions in cancer. And he basically found that TERD1 and MALAD1 are the top scoring ones. But then there's this slur of 43 regions which are muted it beyond what you would expect, and they're all regulatory regions. What does this mean? Is this important? Are these bystanders? What is the bio biology behind it? So a student in my lab came up with the following idea. Let's clone all those into sgRNAs, tiling sgRNA libraries, and blast them and see what happens. A real shramic experiment. So we took the homologous ones because we have learned from our low-grade cleomas that everything which is actually conserved is probably very important. About half of those are completely conserved in mice. So we took oligosynthesis, we made lentival libraries, and then we injected them either into the skin or the mammary gland of mice. And these mice by themselves already have uh, harbor the Cas9 GFP as in the low-grade cleoma model, but they also have a sensitizing oncogene, PR3 kinase. Now, mice with PA3 kinase mutations don't develop skin tumors, but they are sensitized to do so. Think about a mouse which smokes, okay? And then Cree basically excises the Loxoblox cassette, starts expression of PA3 kinase and Cas9 GFP. The way we do this is with ultrasound guided uh, in utero injections. We've got a pregnant mama mouse. We make a midline incision, we exterior, sorry. We anesthetize the mouse. We make a midline incision, we exterior the embryos. And then on the ultrasound, we inject very high titer virus. So what you can see here is an ultrasound. Here's the micromanipulator. Here's the tail of the mouse. Here's the embryo sticking out, this little red ball. And here is the ultrasound um, in magnification. And what you try to do is to stick this needle through the uterus into the amniotic cavity and it spills 62 nanoliters of very high titer virus. And to show that this works, you can take green fluorescent protein and you get a mouse which is completely green. But we want clones, right? So what you need to do is to just reduce the titer. And then you can do this with a rainbow mouse. And you see that these clones are completely independent. And you get 50,000 clones on a mouse. Now, if you include an sgRNA, you get 50,000 different sgRNAs and 50,000 clones of a mouse. Doing so, we took our sgRNA tiling library targeting the fMREs. And the mice are born 10 days later. And all of a sudden, I get a phone call from the mouse house going, Daniel, are you insane? Because that was not the mice we had down there. The mice were littered in tumors the day they were born. And we didn't know. Because we did our due diligence. We infected with an MOI of 0.3, as you would do for a CRISPR screen. That was way too much. So we reduced the titer a thousandfold. And we still got very efficient tumors on the lip, on the back skin, on the ears, and so on. So it's an extremely, extremely big phenotype. Just to show you here, here's the fMRE library, a non-fMRE library, and a control library. They don't develop tumors, but everything with the fMRE develops tumors. To give an idea how strong the phenotype is, we repeated the experiment, knocking down P53. There's P53. So there's something in the fMRE library which is stronger than P53. That was a bit unexpected. We repeated the same thing with uh, the mammary gland, injected the mammary gland of P3 kinase mice. They do develop tumors. Here we did not see a difference in, in tumor latency, but if you looked at tumor multiplicity, there was a huge increase in the amount of tumors forming with the fMRE library over any control. Now, don't take this in too much. This is just the list of the skin. This is the list of the breast, and this is the overlap. So everything which scored in the skin scored in the breast. We could actually take single sgRNAs, tiling these things, and recapitulate that a single sgRNA is enough to actually form these tumors. So that's validating that there's no off-target effects and no confounding effect of the library itself. But so what? Does this, is this this meaningful? Again, we need to go back into a human system. So here we used MCF10A cells. These are these benign, um, non-transformed, immortalized human mammary epithelial cells. They form this beautiful asthenian culture. 
if you knock out PVTC, they get a little bit bigger. If you knock in PFE kinase, they get a little bit bigger, but both of them are non-transformed, don't form tumors in mice. If you combine those two mutations, then they become transformed and form tumors in mice. So there is a progression, basically, which you can use as a synthesized background to um, work up any secondary hit, right? So what we did here was just repeating the screen now with all the human fMREs. We did a normal, MC, a normal um, CRISPR screen, basically, but we had three different readouts. The one readout was just in 2D, how quick do the cells grow or, or, or disappear? We did a 3D screen asking, does a normal asthenia form into abnormal structure? And we did a xenograft screen asking which of these fMRE as gRNAs can push the cells to freely form tumors. Now, I'm showing you here the xenograft experiment, and you can very clearly see that the fMRE really kicks these cells into forming tumors. If you look closely, again, the top hits are the same hits we pulled out from the completely independent mouse experiment. There are three new sgRNAs as top hits, but all these are human specific. It didn't exist in the mouse. And then we can validate every single one and we get very, very, very strong tumor phenotypes. Now that shows you that in mouse and in human, targeting regions which are mutated in cancer are actually super, super, super tumor promoting. And the same thing happens actually when we take the same sgRNAs into the mcf 10 a cells. And trust me, I work with mcf 10 a cells a lot. These phenotypes are really, really, really loud. Now, let's quickly look at the sgRNA which we got out. So one of them was a region, the fMRE region 5, and the genes you have there is WIMB1 and MIR21. MIR21 is an oncomere, well known. And what I like to see in a screen is clustering of sgRNAs, right? And you see a very clear cluster of targeting sgRNAs here in the 3 prime UTR and upstream here. Now the question is, what is the target gene? Is it WIM1 or MIR21? I might skip this one. So we did just sgR uh, RT-PCR. WIM1 is not changed significantly by targeting any of those regions. But if we target the regions which form tumors, you see that there is a three to five fold increase of the Oncomere 21. And we know that Oncomere 21 is actually tumorigenic in that system. And we have done now knockdown experiments and overexpressing experiments, and it's phenocopying everything which we see with the regulatory region. And the second example is ZFP36L2. Now that was interesting because in a prior screen, we have already picked up ZFP36L2 as a completely new tumor suppressor within head and neck and mammary epithelium. And here we're getting DSG RNA is actually targeting the three prime region, the five prime UTR region, or the promoter. And all of those actually give tumors. Now that indicates that these are downregulating ZFP36L2, which is true. One small side notice is that this enhancer region, when we did motive analysis, turns out to be a P53 targeting site motive. And if we do an experiment to ask, is P53 regulating set of P36L2 by using Nutlin, which leads to ample regulation of P53, we see that set of P36L2 is P53 responsive, but not so if we have got uh, sgRNA targeting the enhancer, region, uh, the enhancer region up here. So this indicates that set of P36L2 is a target chain of P53, We've identified a region which is mutated in human cancers and when mutated is not upregulated. And we have shown that ZFP36L2 itself is a tumor suppressor. Now, the summary of the second part is that mutations in fMRE induce tumors in mouse and skin and breast, that MCF10A cells in the sensitized background can be used to identify fMRE drivers in human context. And that there's a really huge overlap between mouse and human fMREs. But for me, very, very surprising is how strong these mutations are. And we have now two examples where we've got a little bit of mechanistic insight, but I actually think we know the least of most of these dark matter mutations. Now, um, my lab is doing that, I told you, in the brain, in the skin, and in the mammary glands, but we have many, many stories now in the lung, in the pancreas, in the gut, and the overduct, and we're developing more and more and more systems to actually do these screens. It is really quite interesting that, for example, the long tail of cancer 
converges always onto one pathway, but it's always different in every single organ. And I think with these tools, we can now chart the way and work through every single organ and ask what are the tumor suppressive events. But we can also do other experiments. So it's all based on littering and peppering thousands of clones into an organ of a mouse. And we can ask about complex interactions between the driving oncogenes and things we don't know. We have now developed CRISPR Koala, which is a system where we can, in the same cell, knock down a gene and upregulate a gene. And we can do comparisons. We can walk across chromosome arms, which are actually amplified or lost in cancer, and ask other interactions between chromosome arm losses and gains. And these are fun experiments. We've done a lot of experiments now where we use this system to pepper a wild type mouse or, for example, a RAS mutant mouse and ask which genes selectively drop out in the RAS mutant versus the wild type. And that gives us maybe bona fide new drug targets. And that works really, really nice. We're developing a new system called CRISPR STAR to do that more efficiently. The third thing we are doing is thinking about therapy resistance and, and what to do with our patients. The reality is patients come to the clinic, they get standard of care. Standard of care works beautifully. Chemotherapy works beautifully. The problem is at one point it stops because there's acquired uh, resistance or pre-existing resistance. But to be honest, we don't know anything about these resistance factors and it's a black box. So what we do is we take again, a p 3 kinase mutant mouse, for example, we pepper thousands of mutations on these mice we treat them with gamma irradiation, chemo radiation, targeted therapy, or immunotherapy. What we see is that most of these incipient tumor cells actually disappear over time, but the resistant one grows out. And these tumor phenotypes are then easy to work up because there's a gain of function phenotype, and you can do the whole molecular range to figure out why they are actually causing resistance. But if you again charter this across all the organs and across all the mutations, you could potentially make a lookup list for oncologists to go, well, that would be standard of care, but you've got this mutation, therefore you're likely not to respond, let's do something else. So I think it's super important to start doing these things much more systematically than not. And it needs to be unbiased. And this is inherently unbiased. The last thing is that we also with uh, n Claude Gingera do um, in vivo proteomics, which I'm not gonna address right now. So it takes a village. Um, the first story I told you about was from, from Connor, my first PhD student, absolutely terrific to work with him. The other story I told you about is from Robin, um, uh, who is the MD PhD student about to um, finish up. But super important was Sam Logatan, who is now at McGill, um, my first postdoc, who really helped with this in vivo CRISPR screening uh, paradigm. I told you about Robert Jenkins, our collaborator from the Mayo Clinic, and I pointed out Yuri Reimert, another very important collaborator of mine at OSCR. And with this, I really, really want to thank our funding bodies. But most importantly, if you want to do anything along those lines, shoot me an email. We're super happy in training people, shooting viruses. We have been now taking viral libraries and sent them around the globe. Um, but you can also train in my lab. Collaboration is the only way we're going to push this forward. So thank you. That was brilliant. And I told you guys that he was perspicacious, right? So. <laughs> So I don't want to embarrass Daniel, but I just want to say to the trainees in the room, you know, a lot of the traits that make Daniel such a brilliant scientist, I see in like all of our trainees as well. And the first thing is, is that you look at his passion, right? Like you can tell how much he loves science, right? And it comes out and it drives his work. And, and as long as you really love your, what you're doing that much, you're probably going to do, do it well. Um, the second thing is, is that as you can see, he's looking at the same data sets that we all look at, but he's finding different things, right? And I think it's that's because Daniel is able to look at things through a different lens. And sometimes the biotechnological platforms that he builds provides him with that different lens. But I think it's also about examining your data from different angles and not just looking down the bottleneck of whatever your null hypothesis is and just finding what you think you're gonna find. I always tell the people in my lab, like make sure you look at the side data, right? Make sure you look at the side observations. Don't always think that science is linear and just gonna take you to one place. And Daniel is more than linear, he's like a supernova of, of lines in different directions. And he, he's able to find things that other people don't find. So just think about those things when you're designing your next experiments about how 
Daniel has approached things because I think it will really, really benefit the work you do. And the last reason I forgot to tell you why I like Daniel so much is because he's Austrian and so am I. And he sounds like all my relatives. So, so um, Daniel, thank you for such a brilliant talk. And I'll very quickly open, I want to take questions and I'm gonna repeat the questions so the Zoom people can hear them. So let's open to questions. I'll start very quickly to ask you, you know, it's so interesting because as you were speaking, I was thinking of many things, but also about the fact that here at McMaster, we have this brilliant population health research institute where my colleague Guy Paré, who does all of our incredible, he's our chair of population health genomics. And of course, one of his tools in his toolbox is SNPs and SNP arrays because he's population health. But it's interesting how we all stick to our own toolboxes when we do things. And I'm now wondering, like, should I be doing SNP arrays on my patients? Like, tell me what you think of that. Like, are we gonna have to broaden the way we look at disease now because of such insightful observations as yours? So uh, I actually think, there are many GWAS studies done, right? Um, so most of that data is actually already out there. We haven't really been very good in linking GWAS data, tag SNPs to what they do or to the proteins they regulate. And I've got this one crazy idea of taking our mouse model and taking all the GWAS data of psoriasis and atopic dermatitis and just taking the genes left and right in EQLT and blasting those and asking, do they change the tumor, uh, the disease phenotype? and then linking it back to the human. So I think a functional handle is gonna help us a lot. And that actually might also open up new avenues to actually treat these diseases, right? Because if you know the target, and these are apparently very, very common in the human population, that's why they turn out in Chivas, it's actually all there. Right. So it's about connecting the dots and just playing and being, it might be a crazy experiment and not work. There are many experiments in my lab which are crazy and don't work. But. So you probably need an interplay because not all of us are as talented at looking at data sets, public data sets as you are. So a nice interplay between your biocomputational people and your, and your biologists to interrogate these things and then test them experimentally. You do both obviously, but I think it's good to build a team like that too. Questions for Dr. Schramick? Come on, there must be some questions. Are you all just so stunned or overwhelmed, <laughs> Peter? So the story is told in a paper and in a talk on never how to develop. Eh? So the story um, with, the, with the CRISPR SNP mice was actually that I didn't go out and made a SNP mouse and then waited for 500 days. And then the first thing we did was basically just using our CRISPR technology to blast again the region itself and ask if I mutate that region, do I see a tumor phenotype? Then we sequenced that region and turned out, yes, we get actually very, very nice SNP mutations and that caused the tumor phenotype. And then we made the mouse because of the germline mouse. So I think you can actually work and it inspired actually the idea of the secondary story where we just tiled the whole region and ask what gives us a phenotype. The SNP replacement, to be honest, for, for in a mouse mode, but also for patients, the problem there for cancer is you would need to be able to replace every single SNP in every single cell of every single tumor, and that's not going to happen. But we know that MIC is actually quite important. And I just read this one paper about metulloblastoma and MIC, and they found a a druggable <laughs> system, and maybe one should try that, but. <laughs> Any other comments? Uh, Ali, please. It's a very naive question, but I don't know. So, but in the case of cancer, do you think that it seems really that the way you explain our compliance is, that is mainly driven by, like, you know, the public environment? Like, really, like, I mean, the reason and, and a tumor, we have a tumor in the organ, it's 100% mutated because of driven by, by mutation, or no, it's also the environment of that particular organ has an effect. So uh, Dr. Ashkar just asked about the role of environment as well in terms of genome being the driver of cancer um, and Dr. Shramik. My take there is environment is extremely important, but most of what we know from environment is usually environments which either cause mutations, smoking, pollutions, whatnot, or who have a big um, hormonal factor, right? Um, we see this in hormone-dependent cancers like prostate and whatnot. There is certainly also other, uh, other environmental factors which are important, like stress. But I think 
that these are probably less prevalent than the genetic hardcore mutation in KRAS V12C. Um, but that's not my area of expertise. So that's more a feeling than hard facts, I would say. I wonder if Dr. Ashkar's question may have been partially driven by our keynote speaker from our first CDCR annual research symposium where Charlie Swanton came and told us his most recent story. I don't know if you heard this story yet. We can talk about it at dinner, but air pollution and never smokers is not actually the initiating event of, um, of non-small cell lung cancer. It's the promoting event. And it's actually baseline EGFR mutations in normal lung tissue that are the substrate of the initiating event. So we, that's sort of, we were wondering about for Charlie, it, it sort of flipped on his head, his idea of genetic contributions to cancer versus environment. And now he's- But it's the environment inducing mutations, right? Yes, the environment is, com is promoting the yeah, mutation yeah. in this case. And for sure, un uh, underlying, even silent inflammation is for sure a very heavy driver. But I think only if you have got the underlying genetic and germline mutations to allow that to happen. Mm -hmm. Sorry, next question. Hong, please. Now with so much different layer of information to know and press on our genetic and all these diverse cancer types, what do you think we should prioritize some data large data set to narrow down to out of the entire is to the disease specific? So Dr. Hans two-part question, um, the role of introns and splice variants in all of this, and how do we prioritize all of the data sets that we're looking at to find mutational drivers? So we actually, if there's an intronic enhancer or regulatory regions, we tout the two and we have got somewhere you hit and it gives you a tumor phenotype. The splicing is difficult because you've got splice acceptors and splice mutated. And with sgRNA, it's hard to get to those. I always envision to you actually use base editors to do a screen around those systems, but that's not easy. And the third question was how to prioritize. Now, the reality is that every single tumor in the, in, in the clinic has hundreds of uh, coding mutations and thousands of non-coding mutations. And the real reality is that there's good mathematical model out there that probably three to five mutations is enough for the tumor phenotype. So most of it is bystander. And I think the only way to really get to what is what is through functional systems. And then we need to broaden the functional systems because what we are testing right now is only what actually kicks a tumor into existence. But many of these mutations might, or a handful of these mutations, other mutations might be responsible for metastasis, might be responsible for, for therapy resistance and whatnot. So we just need to work our way down that system. But the only way of doing that, in my opinion, is through functional approaches because you can sequence deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper but if you hit a long tail, and these are long tail mutations, no matter how deep you sequence, you will never be powered enough to actually call it what happens. And even if you were to call it by bioinformatic means and spending another 10 years of sequencing tumors, you still don't know what's happening, right? So you need this functional output. If you don't know what RS557 is doing, you would know that you probably need to do something about MIC. So you need both, right? I think Dr. Schreimick just saved us 10 years on, so. <laughs> Question in the back, Jolt, please. <laughs>
Okay, so number one is our frequently mutated um, events pan cancer. And then the second question is more about um, modeling that I'll let Dr. Shramik summarize because Joel, that was too much for me. So uh, Dr. Dr. Zador is actually a rare combination. I think you'll love him. You need to meet him because he's a neurosurgeon and a biocomputational uh, scientist. Oh, we need Both. more of those. Yeah, yeah. Um, the first question, so... Yes, by definition, what we are doing right now is pan cancer because where we started was this bioinformatic approach of using whole genome sequencing pan cancer. So there to have enough power to call frequently mutated region, every cancer was basically lumped together. I actually think that there are going to be tissue specific ones, but for breast, we only have what 60, 70, 80 whole genomes and that's too little to really call these frequently mutated regions. And that's also the reason why I actually think that we were quite lucky of pulling them out in breast and in skin. And that's because they're pan cancer, right? Um, your second question about the modeling tools, we have been using those and I think they are very strong. They're also becoming better. I think it's still a little bit in its infancy and that's not because the modeling is in its infancy. It's because the underlying data we have is probably not um, deep enough and tissue specific enough. So most of what we have in high C data is actually healthy cells or some cancer cell lines, but not necessarily the local glioma cells you're looking at. So you need to go back and then do your own high C. We did that. That's actually super expensive, by the way. But then the problem is that the resolution you have is still, if you spend a lot of money, 5KB. So you not get so much better. And then there's just a, a limit of resolution where then you get information about it, but you need to go back and do more high-res uh, hypothesis-driven interactions, right? So that's a little bit where the disconnect is. I actually think that as time progresses, we're going to get better and better and better. So we just need to keep on nagging on it and not stop. Excellent. Okay. Well, with that, help me again. Please th thank Dr. Shramik for his wonderful talk.